Ishikoach, Patrick. That Devar Torah was truly excellent. You took on theology and with it the impossible questions of theodicy. Theodicy refers to attempts to explain God's silence or God's absence in the face of human suffering. In other words, if God is all good and God is all powerful, how or why does God allow such terrible things to happen in the world? This is a highly relevant question as we mark seven weeks since October 7th, when about 1,200 Israelis died. And more than 200 people still remain hostage in tunnels under Gaza. And almost 13,000 Gazans have died, 40% of them children. And today, as 25 hostages have been released, or possibly by the time I'm speaking, please God, more have, and people are receiving, they are receiving medical care and soon will be returning to their families and their homes. Today, as caravans of aid trucks are making their way into Gaza, we're still left with questions. Why did some live and others die? Why are some hostages on their way home and others not? Why are some families rejoicing and others waiting in agony? These questions are hanging in the background of every news report that we refresh and refresh and refresh on our phones. And if we try to reconcile it with a logic, with any kind of logic about God, it's nearly impossible. As you described, Patrick, people try to solve this problem, the problem of God's presence or absence in many ways. First, the theology you first spoke of, which is most featured in the Torah, is that God turns away from us or hides God's face when we turn away from God, when we turn away from God's teachings. In other words, bad things that happen are punishments or curses in response to our bad behavior. In the face of true tragedy, however, this theodicy is inappropriate and even abhorrent. While our actions do have consequences built into them, and collectively we bring untold misery onto ourselves through violence and hatred and greed and corruption and power imbalances and all forms of injustice, we are witness now and always to countless innocent people who suffer terrible fates that are unrelated to their deeds. Identifying honestly the seeds we planted that contribute to the tragedies we experience is valuable and necessary work. It is part of teshuva, after all, our Jewish process of repentance that is featured in the High Holy Days. But blaming the victim is not valuable. It is simply cruel. And there is a fine line between the two. Some posit that the reason that God allows evil to fester in the world is that God is all-powerful but not all good. According to this theology, God's oneness contains everything, including both good and bad. Our Yotzer or prayer this morning actually has an adaptation that was corrected from this theology, that was changed from this theology, but the original verse in the prophet Isaiah 45.7 says, Yotzer or uvorei choshech, ose shalom uvorei ra, ani Adonai ose kol ele. I form light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I am Adonai. I do all of these things. Well, intellectually, we might conceive that the creator of all would be the creator of all. How do we trust or pray to or turn our hearts toward a God that isn't on the side of good? that's indifferent to or neutral to or responsible for both good and evil. And while this idea does appear in Isaiah, it is not the predominant idea of God in Torah or in rabbinic writings or in Judaism, which instead is a God invested in justice and peace and compassion and caring for all life. So then some ask, well, what if God is all good, but God is not all powerful? In this approach, God is the force in the universe pulling us toward justice and peace, but God's power is limited. There are multiple related ideas to this, to this theology, including the idea that God constricted God's power and presence. This is the main idea in Lurianic Kabbalah, in order to make space for the universe. And then there's the idea that God restricted God's power in order to have a true partnership with humanity, otherwise known as the covenant or the breach. 
which requires us to have free will. Other religions go so far as to say that there are other forces other than God, forces of chaos and evil that God is battling. But Judaism doesn't, Judaism's commitment to oneness, to monotheism, doesn't allow for such ideas. And the limited, the the idea of God's limited power is seen throughout Judaism from Torah times until now. And many Jewish thinkers imagine God praying with us, yearning, just waiting for us to live up to and return to the covenant, for us to rise to the place where we could actually partner with God in bringing about a time of healing and justice and love and peace on the earth. A similar approach, but different, is that God is all good and all powerful, but God is choosing not to intervene because it's good for us or necessary for our growth. Kind of like what you said, Patrick, when you talked about it being good for us to figure things out on our own. In this theology, God didn't just restrict God's power at the time of creation or at the time of forming the covenant with us, but God is making an ongoing choice to refrain from intervening in the world because it's good or necessary for human development. Sometimes you'll hear people say, God only gives you what you can handle. There are kind of a lot of cliches like this. And this is like an idea that the rabbis had that was called Yisurin Shal Ahava, a suffering that was a form of love. However, the Talmud shows that the rabbis who came up with this idea also were deeply troubled by it. And in, in some cases, they rejected it. While we can and do grow from suffering, it's offensive to imagine God teaching us through evil like the Holocaust or like the last seven weeks or like many other smaller, more personal nightmares. That would be a cruel God. That would be a God utterly lacking in compassion. And given that one of our key names for God is Harachaman, Judaism sides with a God who cares deeply. Some who find all of these explanations to be either offensive or inadequate say that maybe there's no God at all, for it's pretty hard to reconcile the presence of a loving God alongside the horrors of our world. I'll tell you that personally, I find that I'm unable to win any intellectual arguments about theodicy or about God, and I'm not particularly interested in doing so. In the face of this abject nightmare, that Israelis and Palestinians are living through, divine explanations fail. Any rationalization falls short. As you said, Patrick, we do not understand the way God works. And in the face of such terror and torture and bloodshed and suffering, all we can do is cry or be silent or use words of love. What I do know, what I do know is that I experience God's presence on a daily basis, despite it all, despite it all. And the God that I know, the God that I feel, the God that I experience is deeply loving, is actively loving us, all of us now. I cannot explain it. I cannot explain how it all fits together. I know it doesn't add up. But that's what's true, as far as I can see. You said something so perfect, Patrick. You said, even if it seems like God is absent or that God can't help us directly, believing in God anyway is a way of believing in something bigger than ourselves. Praying to God and believing in the divine are ways of acknowledging that we are not all powerful and that we need to find help from sources other than ourselves. The second verse of this week's Parsha speaks to what you're describing. Jacob is running for his life, and he doesn't know where he is. And suddenly, It's often translated as, he came upon a certain place, and he stopped there for the night for the sun had set. But vayifga also means to strike, to hit, to harm, to injure, to attack. It's like he collided with the place or was suddenly struck by the place. 
And on Vayalen Sham Kiva Hashemesh, Rashi, our most authoritative medieval rabbinic commentator, says, the words imply that the sun set unexpectedly, not at its proper time. So combining these, we have the sense of hitting or colliding with sudden darkness. This idea of being confronted by sudden darkness, well, it feels like now. It feels like October 7th and all that has followed. And so what did Jacob do when the darkness attacked him? Well, Rashi argues that he prayed because the word vayifka, in addition to meaning hit or strike, also means pray. It does. And the word makom, place, also is a name for God. It is. From this, the rabbis teach that Jacob invented the evening prayers, Mariv, in that moment, just as light disappeared from the world, just as he was plunged into sudden darkness, his response was to pray. And as you said, Patrick, to believe in something bigger than ourselves, to acknowledge that we're not all powerful and we need help. We need God right now. We need prayers. We need the prayers of our hearts. We need to call out to the source beyond us to turn for help. And Jacob did something else quite famously as depicted in that window. He dreamed. He dreamed in response to sudden darkness, in response to total immersion in darkness. He dreamed. And in his dream, he realized that the world he could see was only part of the truth. And even though God's presence wasn't evident in the world at all times, and even though God didn't save him from suffering throughout his life, and even though it could feel like God was absent for long periods, as you described, when he dreamed, he could see that God's presence was real anyway. Rabbi Dr. Mish Hammer Kosoy of Pardes Institute in Jerusalem says this is how, this is how we can manage our night times. This is how we can manage living in darkness and living in uncertainty when everything feels unstable. She says, when we start to dream bigger, we can breathe a little bit more. What it means to dream in a time of darkness is to not give up on our imagination even when everything good seems impossible, when hope seems to have disappeared, that is what the negotiators were doing in the last few weeks, dreaming of the impossible, getting Israel and Hamas to come to an agreement after October 7th seemed impossible, but they dreamed and they did it. And if 24 hostages can be freed, and please God by now maybe more, or today there will be more, if humanitarian aid can reach millions of people for four days, well then we must dream we must dream that all 240 will come home, that all of the hungry and thirsty innocents in Gaza will have what they need, that the hospitals will have what they need, that Hamas will be disarmed, that new leaders who seek peace, who acknowledge Israel's right to exist, will be found to lead in Gaza and in the West Bank, and that a new government that seeks two states will be formed in Israel and that the settlements will be removed from the West Bank, and that America will lay everything on the line using all of its power and influence to achieve a two-state solution or a confederacy, some way by which both peoples can live in safety and freedom. That this moment we can dream will be the nadir, the lowest point, and two peoples will rise out of this moment toward true coexistence and ultimately a commitment to safety and freedom and peace. Even when it seems impossible, we must dream. Rabbi Jonathan Sachs says of this Parsha, dream dreams, never be afraid to let your imagination soar. Dreaming is often thought of as impractical. Not so. Dreaming is one of the most practical things we can do. It is our dreams that give us direction. On this Shabbat of Thanksgiving weekend, we know that gratitude is interwoven with both prayer and dreaming. Immense gratitude for every hostage who is home, 
deep, full, soaring gratitude for the negotiators, for the peacemakers, for the people who staff the NGOs, the relief agencies, overwhelming gratitude for those who've been working for shared society and coexistence and peace for generations, for the healers, for the trauma counselors, for all those who are seeking to help both sides, all those seeking a future for both peoples, seeking a way forward that honors human dignity and human safety, gratitude, even as we mourn excruciating loss, even as we have so far to go, in a world that is always incomplete, in a world filled with both blessings and immense suffering, now and at all times, gratitude is a choice, a choice to see and name the blessings, to turn in delight toward the blessings despite it all, despite it all. On this Shabbat, even as we pray and as we dream for all that is unfinished, we have true cause for gratitude. So let us be grateful. Shabbat Shalom. <laughs>